Well, I'm delighted to welcome back a couple of guests who've been on the channel before, Honor Phillips and Will Blackburn. And I'm even more delighted, let's say, to get Igor onto the channel uh, for the first time to talk about the experiences of running convoys. As you'll know, if you watched the video from earlier this week, Igor has uh, delivered, I think, 75 extraordinary aid convoys. This is a remarkable number. It's an absolutely unique achievement. Every single journey is a risk, uh, but every single journey brings extraordinary relief and help to Ukrainian civilians and military on and near the front lines. We are today going to talk about the experiences of running those convoys, the impact they have, but also, of course, impressions from the East. And of course, there is an ulterior motive here. We are planning to make a film. We want to fund a film so that these journeys can be captured, um, so that the experiences along the way, the impact they have on frontline troops can be captured, as well as trying to capture the extraordinary devastation of the East, but stories of positive people living their lives, people surviving, people being resilient, and the extraordinary Ukrainian spirit. That's what we are going to try to capture in that. So without further ado, let's sort of jump into the conversation. Now, let's start with Will. Will, we've talked before about the inspiration behind these convoys. What are the challenges, though, in terms of fundraising, organizing, and logistics of actually running these time after time, uh, almost like clockwork, but in an extraordinary circumstances, uh, the largest sort of war zone since the Second World War? I think the biggest challenge is actually uh, vehicles and fuel. When it comes to uh, donations of equipment, uh, the UK veterans and many civilians in the UK, for example, have been have been brilliant. And that's not the challenge. If, if we need body armor, there are people who provide body armor. If we need helmets, ride helmets. The challenge is, I suppose, it's the distance because you know getting equipment from the UK to Poland to Ukraine is a huge distance, and it's the vehicles keeping them on the road and fueling them up. It's a huge amount of wear and tear. Um, and it's also the logistics of packing everything. Also, and this is where Igor is an absolute genius um, at arranging how those items are packed, because we're going on a very tight schedule. Sometimes there are only five minutes in a place. It's making sure that the correct vehicle is in the correct place at the correct time, notwithstanding situations on the ground. It has been the case in the past where we can't go to a certain place because it's under fire or the road isn't safe. And it's having to make those quick logistic decisions as well. So in simplest terms, in my view, the biggest challenge always is funding fuel, funding maintenance and funding vehicles. And Igor, how, I mean, one of the biggest questions here is you run these on a very sort of tight arrangement, as Will has said, how do you maximize the security of your team? How do you make sure that your route isn't sort of known or leaked to the enemy um, and, and, and keep this extraordinary operation going with the sort of maximum possible security? It's everything is changed. The first weeks of the war, first month of the war, I don't know too much about safety on the war area, but step up. Step by step, we try walking much more deep. And every war, every month, we was much more closer to the first line. And almost three years now we're working with near the first line. And we working with soldiers. We working with soldiers in Poland. We working with soldiers in Ukraine. We working with different people of different uh, level of security. And we training a lot about uh, safety by itself. And we preparing everything very correctly. It's really similar to something like in my sport, like all the sport. You, you know, in my head, everything in convoy is really similar like I preparing to my race. First, you have a training. You have a, your primary object, what you want. Yes, this is a plan. I want one uh, 
world championships. I want to win champions, world championships. And the same here. I have to drop equipment for that brigade, that place on that moment. And and I won the race when I back to the Poland safety with all team. And this is really similar like my race with my dogs. Everything is correctly where we back saved. That's why step by step we prepare everything. Uh, for the most important is the contacts inside Ukraine. Uh, our contacts in Ukraine are like a big net, and uh, we have connection with different people, and we can check the different peoples uh, because everybody know it. Uh, Ukraine it's a it's inside it's a big corruption. We don't we have. We can't drop equipment in big hub in the key, center of Kiev or Lviv. It's no sense. Our idea is drop equipment and drop helps to the hands on the first line, on the second line. The same about trainings. We train with soldiers, with dead soldiers who will be working in the first line really soon. That's why we try to be very I don't know in English the word very carry, very careful. Uh yeah. oh yes, very careful on the on the on the first line. We don't need a lot of selfie on the on the first mm -hmm. light uh, line. We need to drop everything, prepare everything like we know the how we know the best, and just back. That's all. And next convoy, and next convoy. The planning, training, planning, and fast work. That's all. Well, this is a question for Honor. What was your sense traveling with the convoy of this uh, clockwork operation? Uh, and did it still, even though you're only popping off, you know, for minutes sometimes in some places, did it still give you moments of extended sort of reflection or being able to meet people? Were there other stops where you could, uh, you know, perhaps get a, a slightly lengthier impression and, uh, you know, connect with people? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was. And um, I'd actually like to reiterate something Igor just said, which one of one of the things I was most impressed by <clears throat> is the manner in which Igor goes about organizing these and the way he prosecutes them. He is uh, a professional to the utmost about this. And he and he hits these with the same intensity and um, dedication to detail as he does his sporting career. He's been a professional athlete for 20 plus years. So he knows that to accomplish a, a big mission with all kinds of moving parts and where at any moment the the train can go off the, the, the tracks and everything fall apart, he understands that that's possible. So he plans in in uh, he plans beforehand for things that might go wrong. And also another thing is he's a relationship guy. So um, in fact, to work in a war zone, you have to be somebody who can build relationships and who can meet people because you can't just drive into a war zone expecting everything will be OK. You need to be able to communicate with commanders and brigade leaders and um, local government officials. And that all goes into um, preparation and being somebody who can communicate with people. To your question, um, you know, traveling through Donbass, doing this work there, um, you get you get everything. You get hours of, of solitude as you're going through the wide open fields of sunflowers. And there's mile after mile after mile of, of sunflower fields. It's incredibly striking. And then you stop and you have an aid drop. And you, maybe you're there for 10 minutes. Maybe you're there for an hour. Maybe you're there for longer. It just depends. Um, so the, the times definitely vary. But... Um, one thing which was, you know, one thing which which was true was that each little moment we had was a, a huge punctuation mark um, in in the overall experience. And I'll say, you know, there are times where you're able to sit down with a local commander and he's able to open his heart about, OK, what's going on here? Let me explain to you. Um, the difficulty we're dealing with. Let me try to, um, you know, bring you in to our experience here. Sometimes you get that. And sometimes it's, okay, give us the stuff, get out of here. You know, there's probably going to be 
you know, uh, an artillery attack coming in soon. So it just depends. But it all goes back to relationships. And that's something Igor is really good at. Well, we'll come to that in a second, because that would be my next question for Igor, is how to build those relationships when you only have a short amount of time. But quickly on that, was language a problem? Because I'm assuming that not everyone here, in fact, very few people will speak fluent English enough to, to really convey their stories. Um, how challenging is that? Because I think from our previous conversations, none of you guys sort of speak Russian or Ukrainian, but do you, do you have Russian Ukrainian speakers on the team? How did you get around that challenge? I learned Russian language in school because 30, 40 years ago in Poland, it was communist system. And I'm, I'm 47 years old. And in my first school, I have Russian language about six years. Uh, I not speak very well, but enough for con con communication. And now after three years, of course, I understand Ukrainian. And uh, in Ukrainian army, much more people speak in Russian, like in Ukraine. And citizen, in civilians, it looks little in other, but in the army, much more people use the uh, Russian language. Uh, it's a first thing. Second thing, it's uh, always in our team, somebody, it's a natural Ukrainian. That's why always we have, for example, in our team, Daria. Uh, she working much more in Poland. Sometimes only she's traveling in our team. Uh, but she fixes a lot of things by phone and emails. If we have some problems, we have a lot of connection in Ukraine now who, with people who can help us, and who speak in English, who speak in Polish, who speak in Russians or Ukrainians normally. Uh, that's why communication is not a problem. But first month, it was the big problem because to we have to show the Ukrainian we are reality. We don't need the money. We don't need anything for them. We have to. They have to trust us. That's why step by step, very slow work. It's like in sports. When you're training, when you're preparing, you need a time. Step by step to the, your primary point. That's why it's working because in the, the last three years, we never stop and we never back. And Will, you've had experience of this too. How do you make connections with people, especially local commanders? Because there's going to be a mixture of things. There's going to be potentially distrust, but there's also going to be this thing where some local commanders may have existing networks, existing people. They may, amongst some, be a sort of Soviet mentality of, well, who, who the hell are you? And how do you fit into a sort of hierarchy? Um, what's your experience of, of breaking this down and building sort of trust and a network of uh, trusted contacts throughout what essentially is a th over a thousand kilometer front. Well, um, someone in Ukraine said to me that my Polish is so bad that only the Ukrainians understand me. Um, so I think there's an element of the truth in that because there are many key words in Polish, which I've just about struggled with that are the same in Ukrainian or very, very similar. So. There's a kind of basic level of understanding. Um, and one way or another, I can sort of make myself understood. When it comes to commanders, obviously I haven't had as much contact as e Igor has had, but um, certainly on the last run, um, we were with a, a group of medics who were directly training frontline troops. We were about three kilometers, four kilometers back from the, what's called the zero line. And the commander there, um, hugely uh, competent guy, very interesting, um, very focused obviously on that day on making sure all his men were uh, as, as best trained as possible in the latest medical techniques. But what I found very interesting was that his style and the, the way in which he organized his company and unit was very, very similar to my experiences of uh, British Army. Um, I, I, I didn't actually ask him this question at the time, partly because of timing and the, and the pressures of training. But I suspect he would have been trained by NATO forces or possibly British forces. But certainly at the commander level, um, huge uh, competence, uh, very open to listening to ideas, very keen to find out you know, where we get our equipment from. Um, and so I, I find that, that uh, it's, it's a very similar experience in dealing with commanders to dealing with commanders in the UK. There's a very 
there's a sort of reciprocity in terms of how they organize their time um, and a very great generosity because they're under huge pressure in explaining what is happening on the ground. And very often, maybe we'll move on to that as a, or another podcast another day, what is being talked about on the ground is very, very different to how that's being reported, it's certainly in mainstream media in the UK and elsewhere. The next question, I think, is is a challenging one because I'm doing an interview tomorrow to follow up on this because there's a uh, uh, there's a fantastic Irish filmmaker who has uh, released a video that's getting some traction, and he's calling it the Human Safari uh, in Kherson. Well, that actually is the name that Russian propagandists have given it, but this is the absolutely sort of cruel. Um, tactic of sending an FPV drones, not for military targets, but just for hitting anything and anyone as a terror weapon. How difficult is it for you guys running these convoys not to fall foul either of your comms being detected or just the random intrusion of these kind of, uh, uh, you know, Russian terror tactics using FPVs and so on? Okay. First, we have a connection with the best and the new, the newest uh, systems anti drones. We have connection in Ukraine uh, where we can fix it. The best uh, anti weapon, yes, uh, for that. And uh, for example, we have detectors, the newest detectors in our cars. The first thing. Second thing. Uh, always uh, in the in the near, really near the first line. We never traveling alone. We always traveling in with some soldiers. Uh, military cars, uh, Ukraine cars, a lot of times have another systems like a RAP system, systems, um, anti-drone systems. And uh, next things, we know it everywhere where it's uh, really dangerous. Uh, in our convoys, after 75 times, only one time I saw Russian soldiers at about 800 meters. It was the second uh, second uh, part of the river. Um, usually, we never go so close. About even if we was last time 800 meters, one kilometer from the um, Russian position, we don't see them. We was in the forest, in the tranchee, and uh, always our plan traveling is so far from the Russian soldiers. Of course, drones it's really dangerous, but. We know it where we can driving, where is the area drones. And second thing, if we have to go inside, we have a, dete a detectors and anti anti drones weapon. And of course, we never go without any permission on that area. Always we have connection with Ukraine army, some units who help us and cover us. I, I have one, uh, one more sentence about la uh, last question. Uh, I don't drink vodka, but even that, I have a good connection with Ukrainian army. <laughs> and that's <laughs> really know it what I say, what I would say. That's the athlete <laughs> in you coming out. <laughs> you need a good excuse to turn down the uh, the, the the offer of alcohol. Um, yes, always, always. Uh, it's a tradition. Food and alcohol. But I prefer only food without alcohol. Yes, oh, absolutely. Jonathan, I'd like to make... I'd like to make one short insertion, please. Even, even though, you know, with the nature of this war and the way it has unfolded and the way it has evolved, uh, this war has become more dangerous, not less dangerous, even as we feel more disconnected in the West now than we did on February 24, 2022. Um, the, the seriousness of what takes place in Ukraine has just gone way up. So even though Igor's driving missions, and, and he may say he doesn't actually see Russian troops face to face. Um, it might actually be more dangerous um, with the kind of work he's doing with the way things have evolved. I mean, uh, FPV drones, targeted strikes, um, constant bombing raids, the use of, of cab bombs, which uh, if you get caught anywhere near that, you're toast. Mm -hmm. So the, the risks for Igor and his team for Will are, I, I mean, they are not small. Um, I remember just when when I was with them, um, you know, one moment we were laughing and chatting with some Ukrainian soldiers, um, you know, drinking a cup of coffee. And the next moment we were screaming down a pothole dirt road 
with the the dashboard sensor going off saying there were Russian FPV drones flying over us. So things can change very fast. Um, one other brief insertion I would make is, is we were in Kramatorsk in the evening. When we were in Kramatorsk, there was an air raid siren going off. Uh, we went to one of the small villages outside of Kramatorsk, and it turned out the next morning that like an hour or two hours after we were there, um, uh, one of the Wall Street, uh, one of the Reuters journalists actually who were there in Kramatorsk was killed, and two of his colleagues were injured injured in in a in a Russian attack there. So at at any moment something can change, and there's really there's really no place in Ukraine where you can constantly rest sure that you're safe because things can change just like that. I, I would add as well, on, on the last convoy, which Honor was on, um, where wherever we went, uh, something happened either while we were there or when we left. I mean, in, in Kherson, uh, a policeman was killed while we were there. Um, in as we went from Kherson up to uh, Pokrovsk, uh, a, a hotel we'd stayed at previous year was completely destroyed. Um, as Anna says, when we were near Kramatorsk, in, in a village nearby, uh, sadly a journalist lost his life, and so on and so forth. But we were, when we stopped, Anna was talking yesterday about the um, when we met with the, the frontline commander at the kebab house, he was saying, um, you know, right where we were, as, as Anna was saying yesterday, so very, very close to the front line. As we were driving back from there, the forest was on fire. Now, I don't know whether that was a forest fire or whether that was uh, indirect fire from artillery, but rejoining that road, we were told that the road was being interdicted uh, by uh, both Russian artillery, but also potentially uh, Russian guerrillas who are actually posing as Ukrainians and effectively attacking traffic. So at the time, you just have to get on with it. But post that, you realize that, as Anna says, there's there's really no anywhere that's safe in, in Ukraine. It doesn't matter whether it's Lviv or whether it's the Donbass, it, it, there's, there's just danger. And that has to be an acceptance of these convoys. You, you have to accept that. Well, let's turn to the impact of the convoys, because you've talked about this extraordinary skill you've got at creating a network. Um, how important then is that, uh, not just to know where to drop stuff off, but actually to get the feedback loop going so you understand what is required and when it's required? Because my assumption here is that changes. You've done 75 of these. What was required in the first weeks of the war is probably very different and maybe that differs at different parts of the front at different times. Um, so could you give us a, an impression of how you get that sort of feedback loop going on what's required, when and where? Well, this is a really important question because after a lot of uh, more helps, uh, we know its personality, the some officers and some soldiers on a different range. And... Uh, we know it exactly what they need and our power is bigger and we can fix it much more. And even sometimes it's only socks, yes, and t-shirts, but sometimes it's a medics and sometimes some helmets or uniforms or jacket armors. But it's really important. We have to know it before what they need. I give you an example. Two days ago, I talked with some officer uh, from the uh, small unit in Kharkiv. Uh, they're working in Polygon. It's it's correct word, Polygon? A training area. Training area, yeah. Uh, they're working in the training area and they asked me, Igor, we need 60 compass and 16, uh, it's a shuffle for the, the uh, it's correctly yeah. word, I don't know, so, sorry, yes. Royce, but yes. shuffle, yes. Uh, they need 60 compass and 60 shuffles because last training on Polygon, the new soldiers, after two weeks, never used compass and maps because they don't have and never dig or a tranche because they don't have a shuffles. And they boys now in the first line. You understand how it's the big problems? And that's why we now fix it. And we go in November and bring a next uh, group will be better preparing, for example. That's why sometimes we help the special forces, but sometimes we have to the First line soldiers, total, I don't want to use that word, but 
really amateurs. They spend maybe two weeks only on military training. It's not enough. And of course, in different age, uh, between 20 to 16 uh, and different um, physical uh, performance. And that's why it's really, really hard, hard, but we know it how it's important because of course, we can only watching, but if we don't help them, I think nobody can help them because some units in Ukraine is preparing perfectly, like in all NATO, super equipment. But sometimes five kilometers on the right side, you fight, you find a units with old shoes, dirty uniforms and without enough food. I don't want to talk about uh, anti-drone system reps and uh, drone detectors because usually they don't don't, don't want don't, don't have. Sometimes, uh, for example, our friend Robert from Pol Pol Polish guy who fighting three years in the Storm Brigade, they tell me, Igor, we have only one noctovisor on our twenty people. How we have to storm fighting on the night? It's no sense. They don't have, then they can't fight in the night. And that's why, uh, you know, always we preparing for each unit, what we can fix it and what they need. That's so incredibly important. Well, I've only got, well, I've got two questions together, but I'm going to lump them together and give you all a chance to answer it. One is to give your impressions of the sheer scale of devastation now obviously everything russia does is a is, is a war crime pretty much but i wanted to get that impression of the devastation because this is one of the things we're going to be capturing in the film and the second question is what therefore is the importance of filming one of these convoys capturing not just what the convoy is doing but the terrain that it's moving through let's start with honor and then we'll get to will and then we'll give the last word to igor yeah, so one of one of the most fascinating things I've noticed about the Ukrainians in the last couple times I've gone over there is their unwillingness to let the Russians have the last word. So as you as you drive through Ukraine, if you start in Lviv and then you end up in the Donbass, um, you're going to see many different things all the way from Lviv to the Donbass. You'll see houses which have been flattened, destroyed, blown up. You'll see. Uh, bullet holes in the fences. Um, but you're also going to see brand new houses coming up because the Ukrainians rebuild wherever they can as fast as they can because they don't want to let the Russians have the last word. Now, the moment you get into the East, um, it's a different story. Um, there is, I mean, it's it's hard to find a village which hasn't been affected by this war. And some places, as you've seen, Turetsk, I mean, Bakhmut is, is the now famous example of it, but you have whole population centers which have been not just flattened, but um, like incinerated completely. It's just a, a gray wasteland. But again, <clears throat> the Ukrainians aren't going to let the Russians have the last word. And where they still hold territory, they come in and they try to rebuild and they try to restore. But um, the the level of destruction that the Russians have been willing to perpetrate on the Ukrainians is is staggering. It's incredible. Um, and um, one thing which we've seen over and over and over again is the Russians have basically concluded at this point, if we can't have it, no one can have it. Um, so we will we'll kill everyone and we'll destroy everything. Um, so I say that e even as there are some absolutely breathtakingly beautiful places in Ukraine, I mean, um, from the, the the central region, Kiev, there are so many beautiful places in Ukraine. But at the same time, um, there is a, a massive portion of the country which will never look the same ever again because it has had the living hell bombed out of it for the last three years, but also the last 10 years. Um, so I think it will be years, decades, I don't know how long um, it will take for the Ukrainians to completely recover both the infrastructure, but also the mechanisms to go back to living normal life um, after this war is, is over because of the sheer scale at which it's taking place. Like many have said, it's the largest um, war in Europe since the Second World War. To echo 
what Anna says. It, it is the magnitude of of the front line. Um, I always think coming from a small island like yourself, Jonathan, the sort of the, the idea of big countries is always quite hard to get a head round. But having driven around Ukraine with Igor and, and the guys, um, it, the, just the length of the front line itself, it is it has to be seen to be believed. The scale also of, of mobilization, I, I particularly feel a sense of that. Um, I mentioned before that brigade commander when we were doing the medical training and just realizing the, the level of military mobilization in that area um, and the resources going into that. And then realizing that that particular area is just one very small fraction of the front line. And so the, the human resources, the, the military resources, that, that, that what has to be done to defend Ukraine is, is something that I, I think is, is being lost in the messaging in the West particularly, but I think in the media in general. Um, and I think going to what we were talking about with the film, I think it's, it's, it's important that that message comes across in the film. This is a scale which we have not seen, as Honor says, since the Second World War. And I think if you haven't seen that scale, and I understand why many people haven't, it's very, very hard to understand. But I think if everyone could see that via the documentary, I think it would be a huge shock, as it has been for me and others who joined the convoys. And Igor, last uh, word for you. I mean, when you're traveling this landscape, you must also, in some ways, be imagining your home country because there is the implicit threat that Russia could do to Poland, Romania, the Baltics, what it has done to Ukraine. You know, before the war in Ukraine, I traveling maybe in half of the world because I traveling with my dogs and racing in different parts of the world. But before 24, 22, I never was in Ukraine because no races, no interest. Even my grandmother and grand grandmother live in Kiev. They died before my born date because she uh, she was a my grandmother. Mother was a, she was a Polish, and she escaped from the Siberia. And about ninety thirty six or thirty seven, she stayed in Kiev, and they lived there. Even that, I never was before in Kiev. But I start first traveling five first March two thousand twenty two. Few days after start the full scale war, and. What I understand after that time, that, that people in Ukraine is the same like in Poland, like in Europe. We have the, we have the same jokes. We read similar books. We watch the same films. It's not a big difference between Ukrainian and Polish or another people from the Europe. Maybe when you're traveling across the Ukraine, I see the difference in uh, in urbanization, yes, it's a, like a it's similar like in Poland twenty years ago when we start growing uh, and we wake up from the communism, uh, and even inside it's a big corruption and big problems from Russian propaganda and Russian hands inside Ukraine and of course Russian hands hands it's a lot in all Europe, but in in, in Ukraine is is it's really really a lot uh, Russian powers even that. The mind of that people, it's amazing surviving instinct. I remember one thing. It was a second month of the war, one week maybe after the massacre in Bucha and Irpin. I was there one week later uh, when it was not, not, it was not Russian inside. I then remember one picture. It was a small house total destroyed and the owner of that ha that house cutting first grass in april you understand his house not exist but they have to prepare something small like normal life they try prepare his grass like a perfectly cut and it it i have it's my the pictures i have in my head still because even your house, house destroyed and burned, 
you can start working from the small things step by step and the same is with our helps step by steps from the small things we try help them that's why we want showing that films and the big contrast what i honor say between east and west and after you understand why it looks like that because because you can't afraid free years that's why this national it, it's really that people it's really brave because they of course adapted everyone is adapted to the war to the risk to the scare but you don't want scare for years that's why you one day you fighting and next day you can back to kiev and go to party because your mind need it you need a sinusoida in your life even if you have to fighting in the war that's incredibly moving. In fact, everything all of you have said, of course, is very moving. This is why I think it's so important for the film to capture this. These experiences, these extraordinary experiences are not just historical. They still have a chance to change history, a chance to prevent Russian genocide and autocracy from triumphing and the values of the Russian world uh, not spreading further east than they currently are. Um, that's why I think this project's important. I really implore people watching this to become part of it. Um, you'll see a little trailer now for the film. I know many of you have seen that already. We want to make this happen. We want to have an impact in the world. We want to counter the propagandistic messages of films like Russians at War, which are an absolute travesty that they're being shown, but the alternative truthful version, the version which represents Ukrainian humanity and civilization, is not getting the same traction. We want to address that balance. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Thank you for being part of this film project and supporting it with so much energy and imagination. Let's hope that we can make it happen and share it with the audience. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Jonathan. Thanks. All your engagement with the videos on this channel is massively appreciated, as well as encouraging comments and the financial support you provide. Some of you will have donated to Ukrainian charities, including the ones listed in the descriptions of these videos. I know many of you ask how you could be doing more to help Ukraine, and that includes me. Well, here is news of a project that I think could make a huge difference. It's been initiated by Silicon Curtain and I hope will support Ukrainians on the ground and in the diaspora and create real impact to help ensure a Ukrainian victory. It's a documentary film to be made in Ukraine later this year and shown internationally, hopefully at film festivals and on Silicon Curtain as well. We aim in the film to follow the 75th aid convoy to Ukraine by a remarkable team based in Poland, delivering vital medical, humanitarian and military aid that helps Ukrainians remain resilient. No doubt the efforts of this team has saved innumerable lives of Ukrainian servicemen and women fighting on the front line of freedom. We have a unique opportunity to share authentic stories on the world stage through this film via film festival, social media and streaming to Silicon Curtain. The film will provide a counterweight to Russian propaganda films such as Russians at War. It will show spontaneous stories gathered on the journey as we travel the length of the front line. Filming footage and interviews along the journey, we will have a unique opportunity to convey the shared humanity and common cause of Ukrainians living with war. The film will focus on stories of hope and resilience with the war as a backdrop and aims to create a compelling narrative and tone that is entirely authentic. Well, here's the important bit. We're aiming to raise £12,000 to record the dog sled tournament and create a stunning trailer for the project. Overall, the project will cost up to $100,000 for end-to-end -end production and distribution. For the price of a DVD rental or a streamed movie, you could help create a film that raises awareness of Ukraine's struggle and generates funds for further aid convoys. Supporters of the film will get early access to see it and free access to the film for all time. This is 
a bold and ambitious project, but it will be led by an experienced documentary team with a professional cinematographer. It is time, I think, to join together to achieve something powerful and unique for Ukraine. After reviewing many project ideas, we feel that this is the best way that we can have an impact. Tentatively titled To the Edge of Freedom, here is a short description of the film. A world champion dog sled racer navigates dangerous obstacles through the apocalypse-like battle zones of Ukraine's front line, delivering life-saving aid to ordinary heroes engaged in extraordinary acts of valour. Igor Trux, the team leader, is a remarkable personality and relentless supporter of Ukraine throughout the full-scale war. The film starts in Finland at the World Championship Dog Sled Tournament with Igor. Fresh from his 11th World Championship in dog sled racing, Igor Trantz leads his foundation's 75th humanitarian mission to the front lines of war-torn Ukraine. For this mission, Igor's team is joined by a few friends from the US and UK who will not only provide hands-on support, but share what they learn on the ground with new sources in the West. Our cameras follow Igor from Finland to Gdansk to Lviv to Mykolaiv, Kherson to Dnipro, Pakrovsk, Kharkiv and other frontline cities facing the brunt of Russian aggression. Along the way, they will meet colourful and determined individuals fighting for their families' right to survive. Igor and his team navigate life and death situations to bring much-needed supplies, visiting bunkers, hospitals and units whose success may not merely determine the fate of this ancient culture, but of the West itself. The film will follow Igor's latest aid convoy to the front line and back again. I hope this description will inspire you to become part of the film project and make a difference to the war's outcome a war that Ukraine must win clearly and decisively. Please do find the donation link in the description of the video and do reach out to me if you have any questions at all about the project and its intended impact.